You can see the uh, Louisiana colony there as of 1800 when it belonged to France. And clearly that's going to add a whole lot of territory to the United States. It's going to almost double the size of the U.S. And that's one factor, one factor that's going to lead to a major change in the economy of the U.S. But first, let's talk about what it was before, before we talk about how it changed. So, as of the uh, late 1700s up to uh, the uh, time just before the Louisiana Purchase, there essentially were two American economies. Uh, kind of talked about this before, you know, you had Hamilton and the Federalists on the uh, uh, East Coast looking um, eastward toward the Atlantic and toward global trade, a coastal export economy closely connected with, with Europe uh, and other places. And on the other hand, you had Jefferson and the uh, Democratic Republicans facing inward to the interior uh, where they were looking for um, agriculture to be, to be the future with a very limited view toward trade and instead a view toward wanting America and Americans to be self-sufficient. Now, that was a subsistence economy. That's the type of farm economy that had existed in the colonies excluding the large plantations, which were very commercial. But for most families in the 1700s into the early 1800s, uh, most families lived on farms, individual family farms. And uh, when I say subsistence, that means that uh, they made enough, they grew enough to take care of themselves, essentially. Now, We've talked about Native Americans having a subsistence culture. Um, the colonial farmers and early American Republic farmers were much less of a subsistence culture than the Indians were. You know, the, the Indians would uh, um, frequently share communally much of their food, and when they had an excess, uh, sometimes they would, uh, they would destroy the excess as a sacrifice. Farmers weren't doing that. But what farmers were doing is, um, like I said, they had small farms. They would grow uh, enough to take care of their family. Uh, by the way, these are called yeoman farmers. That means small farmers. And this is the agrarian ideal espoused by Thomas Jefferson as being the future of the country and being the, uh, the heart and soul and spirit of the country. Now, how it would work is that even though we're talking about small farms out in rural areas, they had a sense of community because uh, how it would work would be, so let's say you grow, you have some crops and you grow food and you've got enough food to feed your family. Maybe you'll have a little extra left over. Uh, you will take that little extra that you have left over and go trade it with your neighbor um, for something he has a little left, left over, a little extra of that you don't. And so it's that bartering, you know, it's um, paying the doctor in chickens uh, kind of thing. And there's also, th with this sense of community, a strong sense of cooperation. So that if someone's barn burned down, then all the neighbors would come to work together to rebuild the barn because they knew it might be them next time and they would need the help. So very much a sense of neighborliness and cooperation and a sense of, uh, well, a subsistence economy, not a subsistence culture like the, the Native Americans, but a subsistence economy where you're only producing what you need and maybe a little extra. That is, that is quite different from a commercial market economy where you are intentionally producing as much as possible of a particular thing so as to make as much as uh, possible, make a profit on it, which that, you know, I mentioned plantations, that's what plantations were and always had been, but it's not what small farms were. Now, I, I compare them to, to Native Americans. Um, clearly, 
the, uh, the early settlers were not as in tune with nature uh, and the environment as the Native Americans were. They made more of an impact on the local environment than, than Indians did, but not nearly as much of an impact as the later market economy is going to make. So uh, uh, differences between them and the, uh, the lifestyle of Native Americans is uh, farmers built permanent settlements. Native Americans had towns, but frequently they would move their town every few years. Um, they they uh, practiced controlled burning, but not uh, like the Indians did to control forest growth, but just for clearing fields. They had livestock, uh, which natives did not. And the colonists really weren't that good at reforestation either. But nonetheless, uh, they did uh, uh, create a subsistence economy, and they were the people who, according to Thomas Jefferson, quote, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. And that's the direction he wanted to see the country go in, uh, not that um, uh, transatlantic, uh, even, even global commercial economy that the uh, Federalists, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, and etc., wanted, not all the manufacturing, not the factories that uh, by this time were starting to pop up in New England. No, he wanted to see America built solidly on the back of farmers, the agrarian ideal closely associated with Jefferson. Now, um, Napoleon and his troubles in Europe contributed significantly, uh, very significantly, to the gaining of the Louisiana Territory, obviously, because uh, Napoleon needed to raise cash for his war against virtually the rest of Europe, and uh, Jefferson's envoys were in the right place at the right time, and the U.S. got uh, the L Louisiana Territory, which is a lot more than just the state of Louisiana today. Well, about a decade later, Napoleon's problems once again benefited the United States. Now, uh, this was around the time of the uh, sort of the, uh, the, the high point and the end point of the Napoleonic Wars. And Western Europe, in particular, had been devastated by, by this war. They'd been fighting uh, all through uh, various countries uh, in Western Europe, although not, not uh, England being you know, part of the British Isles. So anyway, a couple of problems so far as Europeans having sufficient food supplies. Number one, uh, a lot of the uh, young men who would have been farming the fields were instead getting shot in the fields. Number two, a lot of the fields were being destroyed in the fighting as well. So this led to, led to devastation in Europe by the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and it led to serious, serious shortages in wheat. And this made the price of wheat, the value of wheat, go up significantly. And for those American farmers who were growing wheat and who had been providing it primarily uh, just for local and nearby markets, all of a sudden, this big demand for it and the increased price made it very profitable to try to transport that, uh, that wheat to market, even to ships to get it across the ocean to sell to Europe. Um, therefore, with this much demand, uh, there was lots of incentive to produce more. Uh, so uh, there was a growth beyond just subsistence, beyond just feeding your family. Now, in Pennsylvania, for a few years before this, the uh, Pennsylvania Dutch, who weren't actually Dutch, they were German, uh, descendants of German immigrants. German is Deutsch, and you know, you know how we Americans are, uh, get things confused. Anyway, they had had, they'd been building larger farms uh, for some time, and 
1795, uh, the, uh, the influence of all these large farms out in um, Pennsylvania Dutch country, specifically Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, led to demand for them to be able to get their goods to market uh, to the cities, uh, specifically to Philadelphia, you know, to provide food for, for restaurants and shops and, and so forth. So, um, also, uh, by expanding, that meant they were hiring more workers, which was, this is around the time the Industrial Revolution is starting, and more workers are going to the cities to work in factories. But here is a, an opportunity for farm laborers to continue to be farm laborers, but working for, for someone else. Anyway, in order to get their goods from Lancaster to Philadelphia in 1795, the state of Pennsylvania invested in building a turnpike. Now, this was a road straight from Lancaster to Philadelphia and vice versa, of course, that was a better road than people were used to because all the roads, once you got outside of towns, were dirt roads. And they usually ran along the routes of old Indian trails. These, these, uh, well, this is the first American turnpike. It was paved with stone, which made it traversable, more traversable, even in, in bad weather. Uh, it was also a, a toll road with toll bridges. So uh, I just jumped back about 20 years from what I was just talking about, about the Napoleonic Wars, 1813, 14, 1815, round in there. Um, and that's because that 1795 road was a template that 15, 20 years later, all through the uh, northern states and some of the southern states, similar roads started being built in order to get agricultural produce to the city markets, and in some cases, because of the demand for wheat from Europe, to get them to port cities to ship over. So, you have three factors coming together. A profit motive, which hadn't really existed except for with plantations before. Um, wage labor available, farm workers, uh, working for, for uh, a salary or for wages. And most important, transportation, transportational advances. Now, all this is going to result in what is known as the market revolution. So let's talk about that. All right, well, now we're going to talk at length about different aspects of the market revolution, which is something that maybe you've never heard of, but it's one of the most important aspects of U.S. history. And it ushered in such huge changes, fundamental changes, not just in how things were done so far as uh, industry and economics, but culture and just how people live their daily lives and even how people thought. So there's two aspects to the market revolution. Number one, it was a transition from a subsistence economy, uh, which uh, I talked about uh, in the, uh, the previous lecture, which is to say that the small independent farms in the early United States were mostly family farms that produced just enough to feed their family with maybe a little bit extra that they would trade with their neighbors. It was a transition from that to a commercial economy. Now there had been aspects of commercial economy in the uh, U.S. and even in the colonies, but it had never been as widespread as it was going to become in the uh, first half of the 19th century. As a result of, this is the second aspect, two things coming together. Improved transportation and improved technology, which those two are closely connected, of course, because the improved transportation was itself a form of improved technology. Another way of looking at it, maybe an easier way, is the market revolution is what you get 
when you combine the Industrial Revolution with the Transportation Revolution. And this is something that was uniquely American. Uh, the Industrial Revolution started in Europe and had profound, profound effects, some of them very similar to what we're going to talk about culturally. But um, the transportation part was not as important because those European countries were very, very small compared to the United States, especially considering the fact around the time that this gets going, the U.S. had increased in size. So transportation is really going to be the key. And there are several different types of transportation that we're going to look at that drew the country closer together roads, and we'll go into some detail about that right here, uh, as well as coming up after we talk, uh, talk about roads, steamboats, canals, railroads, and this may sound strange, the telegraph, which is not a form of transportation, it's a form of communication, but like those forms of transportation, the telegraph drew people closer together. It made distance less of an obstacle and less important. So let's first look at the roads. Um, most roads in the United States, once you got outside of uh, the major cities uh, that had streets, once you uh, got out into the countryside, most roads were uh, blazed over old Indian roads or trails. They were, uh, they were dirt roads. And this was true all throughout the 1700s until the uh, first turnpike was built in the U.S. in 1795 uh, from Lancaster to Philadelphia, which isn't a great distance, uh, and that was paved with stones. Now, um, in the early part of the 19th century, around the time, well, right after, right after the uh, War of 1812, which ended in 1815, the U.S. started to turn its attention toward infrastructure. Uh, the American system uh, that was championed by Henry Clay uh, was, was part of this. There was a national road built that basically led uh, from those uh, Atlantic states out into the Midwest. So it was a, a road you could travel to, to get out there. And then a few years later, this guy... Uh, up there in the upper right becomes important. Now he was from Scotland. He lived in Scotland. He wasn't American himself. Um, create his name is John McAdams, and he created a new type of road that was going to be revolutionary. It was called macadamized roads. And here you can see a, a picture of a macadamized road being built, in which basically they. They lay this uh, sort of boundary at the edge of the road, the edge of the dirt road, and then they start covering it with rocks, but not great big huge pieces of slate. McAdams, what was revolutionary about him and his, his road was he figured out a bunch of little tiny rocks give you better traction than great big rocks, which can be kind of slick, right? So essentially, Gravel roads is what we're talking about. Gravel roads made all the difference because once they had these, then you could travel these roads in the winter. You could travel these roads when it was raining. Now, those uh, turnpikes that I was talking about, you could travel them better than you could travel a dirt road, but you still didn't get the kind of traction you were now able to get with a macadamized road. All right. Well, most... Uh, long distance travel still was done not by land, not by the roads, but on rivers. And you were kind of limited in your ability to travel on a river because, for the most part, this traveling was done on rafts um, or canoes, but you really can't carry much on a canoe. So uh, rafts to carry uh, to carry goods downstream and that's the only direction you could go is downstream following the river um, you couldn't turn around and go back upstream well why can't you just row you might say well you try rowing a great big raft upstream for for very far and and see how far you get it just wasn't practical to even uh, 
uh, attempt to do that. So, uh, in the early days of the United States, there was a lot of raft travel along the rivers, particularly the Mississippi River, um, once the uh, Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase was made. So, a couple of different types of, of boats that essentially were, uh, at least uh, the flat boat was essentially a, a raft um, that had like a little building on it so that you could put stuff in and keep it dry. And uh, keel boats, which had kind of the, uh, the curved pointed prow uh, on, on both sides that made it travel through the water uh, faster and more efficiently. Now you'll notice there's oars on there. What's the deal? You just told me that you can't um, row up river. Well, those oars aren't for, uh, for rowing up a river. They are mainly for pushing off from the river bank. And you can see in the picture on the left, those guys in the keelboat, that's what they're doing. They're pushing off. Well, um, let's just, uh, well, let's look at an example where you've got um, kind of the primitive roads that they had at the time and river travel kind of worked hand in hand. Uh, the Natchez Road, also called the Natchez Trace, uh, which uh, was a road that led uh, essentially from Nashville down to uh, uh, Natchez, uh, Mississippi. So let's just say that you were a farmer, oh, let's say in Hendersonville, somewhere close to Nashville, and you have some goods that you want to sell at the best market. And the best market are, are the ones down, uh, downstream, downriver on the Mississippi, uh, such as in Natchez. So what you would do is you would load up your stuff on wagons, probably, and you would head west to Memphis. And once you got to Memphis, you would buy a raft and maybe hire a crew if you didn't have enough people working for you. Um, a flat boat or a keel boat and then you would float down the Mississippi River until you reached your destination in Natchez. Once you got there um, your raft is now worthless uh, because you can't get it back up the river again so um, probably you're gonna sell that for firewood or something. And then you're going to unload your goods, take them to market, and sell them. And this is a very busy market, so you probably are going to sell them. And then you got to get back home to Nashville, and you can't go up the river. Uh, what you're going to have to do is walk, essentially. Um, walk or maybe buy a, buy a horse or, or a wagon or whatever, but you got to travel by land. Uh, northeast along that road to get back to Nashville. Now each one of these little dots is called a stand and that essentially a stand was uh, an inn slash tavern a place you could stop uh, and buy a meal, buy some drinks, uh, maybe uh, stay overnight kind of like a kind of like a motel with a bar attached. Now, this whole process is dangerous because as you're walking up that road, there might be enterprising entrepreneurial people who want to uh, uh, engage in some basic capitalism uh, by robbing you uh, because they know anyone walking north on that road is coming from Natchez and they've probably got money, right? So you were kind of taking your life in your own hands. There were a lot of murders along that road and at these various stands. In fact, um, you were taking your life in your hands the whole, the whole process because even when you were uh, floating down the Mississippi River on that raft, you might run into river pirates who uh, uh, would uh, try to board your craft and get you off of it. Uh, which might uh, might include uh, killing you so that they can get your material, your goods, and take them down and sell them themselves, right? So coming and going, you're in danger. 
So uh, that's why this uh, Natchez Road or Natchez Trace was also sometimes called the Devil's Backbone. Here we have a, uh, a cartoonized uh, representation of a historical person, Mike Fink, who was uh, the captain of a group of those riverboat pirates known as Mike Fink, King of the River. And he became a larger-than-life character, as he's represented here in this caricature. And we'll actually be talking more about him in just a moment. But all that changed with the advent of the steamboat, a boat powered by a steam engine, often uh, an engine that was fed with, uh, with coal to keep the fire burning to produce the steam. Uh, that was important because a steam-powered boat could travel downriver, then turn right around and travel back upriver, and that opened up all kinds of opportunities. The first steamboat, uh, created by Robert Fulton, created and captained the Clermont, navigated the Hudson River in New York in 1807. Four years later, the first steamboat plied its way onto the Mississippi River, and by 20 years later, there were 200 of them operating regularly on the Mississippi. Now, there were lots of advantages to a steamboat. Like I said, you can, you're not limited. You can go up, you can go back, uh, you can go down, you can come back up against the current. Uh, one of the uh, disadvantages was kind of an unfortunate tendency to uh, blow up if the, uh, if the boilers got overheated. You know, you've got to let off a little steam uh, or you'll, you'll blow your top. And that happened from time to time. In fact, I saw a, saw a report in a Cincinnati newspaper about a steamboat that had exploded on the Ohio River and that uh, they said that body parts were raining down like a quarter of a mile, half a mile away. So that'll ruin your day. But it was still, it was still considered to be worth the risk by people who wanted to ship their goods, uh, particularly if they were people wealthy enough to hire somebody else to travel uh, on the boat with the goods. Okay, things get opened up even more after the War of 1812 when New York State invests in a canal, the Erie Canal, that uh, connects ultimately the, all these different rivers to the Great Lakes. It was finished in 1825, 363 miles long. Now think about this for a moment, what this means, especially now that there are steamboats, is if you've got goods you want to ship somewhere, you can be in Boston or Philadelphia and you can travel up the river. Then you can travel west on one of these rivers, get to the Great Lakes, and get up there into that Ohio country. Um, and that's something that you would have had to have uh, taken a boat part way, then unloaded it, put it on a wagon, and so on and so forth. This is also revolutionary. By 1837, um, there were 3,000 miles of canals in the United States, most of them in the north. All right, well, uh, another big uh, revolutionary invention was the railroad. Trains, not invented in the U.S., I think they were invented in England, but introduced to the United States in 1828 with the Baltimore and Ohio, which was the first commercial railroad in the United States. By 1860, there were 30,000 miles of railroads in the United States, most of them also in the North, and this uh, not only opened up travel, but it also opened up various types of industry, especially iron and steel production and coal mining. Because, for one thing, the, rail, the, the train's also driven by a steam engine, a boiler that has to be, you know, uh, fed with coal. Uh, also, 
a lot of iron and steel for making these trains and also for making the railroad ties enough railroad ties to cover 30,000 miles so um, all of those industries get uh, significantly spurred on and finally that non-transportation item the telegraph developed by Samuel Morse in the 1830s put into commercial use in 1844 which kind of like sealed the deal uh, pulling everything together if you're not familiar with what a telegraph is why it's this device you see on the upper left in which the operator taps out a message in Morse code uh, surprise and it travels along the wires just like telephone wires and can immediately be picked up on the other end by an operator who also knows Morse code so you can send messages practically instantaneously great distances now uh, imagine how helpful that would have been at various points in American history when huge huge blunders were committed because people hadn't gotten the news of recent developments in time all right well here's a guy that we've talked about uh, we have talked about and we will talk about um, in, uh, in other contexts Eli Whitney whose inventions first of the interchangeable musket parts and then the cotton gin were actually right there at the beginning stages of the Industrial Revolution in the United States and I go into much more detail elsewhere about the cotton industry in the South but uh, I'm showing you this to uh, uh, to inform you that yes indeed the cotton industry because of this technology dominated the South but there were some agricultural advancements made in the North as well where wheat was concerned uh, including a couple of important inventions in the 1830s the steel plow invented by good old John Deere and the mechanical reaper invented by Cyrus McCormick this is going to lead to a lot more wheat being produced now I think earlier I talked about how uh, right around the time of the War of 1812 and right after there were huge markets opened up in Europe for American wheat because of the devastation of the Napoleonic Wars well here we are 20 25 years down the line and you've got more mechanical technological advances that make it possible to grow more wheat so uh, let's take a look at the United States in the early 1800s there's that huge Louisiana territory that uh, Jefferson bought from Napoleon in the 1800s right before the market revolution started uh, just started to take off the center for production of wheat in the United States was this region right around here um, just north of Washington DC uh, Pennsylvania uh, Maryland and northern part of Virginia uh, a lot of it right there uh, sort of in the upper right hand part of that circle in Lancaster which was in Pennsylvania Dutch territory but you know with the uh, purchase of the territory the Louisiana territory and all these transportation advances agriculture started moving west just like people were moving west also uh, I have to bear in mind that this is the Industrial Revolution right so uh, factories are starting to be developed initially mostly cotton mills textile mills but more and more different kinds of uh, factories iron foundries for example uh, and so more and more people are moving into the cities to work in those factories and so that leads to a change kind of a shift in agriculture in the north those uh, areas like the one there uh, centered in Pennsylvania uh, that had been the center of wheat production before they had provided the uh, the wheat and a lot of the other crops for much of the Atlantic coast well now that uh, these transportation and technological advances have allowed agriculture large-scale commercial agriculture to move westward uh, 
then those western farms start supplying the uh, the the eastern seaboard and those uh, smaller farms there in the east uh, they wind up focusing almost exclusively on providing uh, food for the nearest cities to them so after the introduction of the steel plow and the mechanical reaper um, wheat production triples the market begins to expand why does the market begin to expand let's think about that for a moment now the uh, the old Northwest let's take another look at that uh, take another look at that map uh, there the the old Northwest was opened up for settlement people had been wanting to to settle in that for a long time um, but the people who did go and settle there they were subsistence farmers uh, because there wasn't really an opportunity to to be a commercial farmer because if you're up there in Michigan or somewhere and you're growing uh, growing crops it wasn't feasible to think that you would be able to transport them all the way to the Atlantic coast they'd go bad uh, it was too much uh, too much work just trying to get there so what would happen uh, usually um, instead is that uh, a few people would move in the area make claims to some land and farm just for their families but now now that the trains can reach Ohio and the Michigan Territory and steamboats can go along and use these canals and get to the Great Lakes and reach Ohio and Michigan what that means is not only can individual families move there just to try to you know to, to make a living for themselves business interests can go there um, because it is now it is now economically feasible to have large farms and large crops with which you're going to um, be able to sell a lot in markets back at the east and that means that since that's the case more people are also going to be moving out into Ohio and Michigan population is going to increase as well so that's a lot of changes just dependent on that one thing and that leads to the growth of new population centers like the city of Chicago which was little more than a wide space in the road uh, circa 1840 by 20 years after that was a large city and by 20 years after that was a metropolis and one of the biggest cities in America because it was the center of the railroad hub and the meatpacking industry now with all these factories going up there's going to be more changes than just uh, not getting as much sunshine uh, one change is that the days of the individual craftsmen become limited now this happens to a limited extent in the Industrial Revolution it happens in a much larger way uh, 40 years or so later in the second Industrial Revolution starting in the 1870s but it starts here so before you had a craftsman an artisan let's say for example a cobbler someone who makes shoes a master cobbler knows how to make a complete shoe start to finish every step of the way and uh, if he's a really good cobbler his shoes are of high quality they're in demand they fetch a high price which makes it worthwhile all the labor he puts into making them by hand by himself or perhaps with an apprentice whom he is training but now we've got factories and when you've got factories you can have boot factories and when you got boot factories they hadn't really uh, they hadn't introduced the assembly line yet that was going to be in the 1890s but they had introduced the idea of the production of an item like a boot being divided into several smaller tasks requiring less skill so you don't have to be a master cobbler your job might just be to nail the sole of the shoe onto the shoe uh, and you can learn that pretty quick
And since you can learn it pretty quick, it's not a valuable skill, so you don't get paid much. Because if you quit tomorrow, they can pretty easily find somebody that they can teach to drive a nail into the heel of a shoe. So that means faster output of boots and shoes and whatever other items are being manufactured. More of them can be made. And when you can make more of something more quickly, then you are increasing the supply. All right. When you increase the supply, you decrease the demand uh, so that the cost of these items goes down because it's not taking as much to make them. Uh, and that's going to lead to e ever cheaper wages for the people working in these factories. Now, if you are an artisan, a craftsman, let's say a, a cobbler or a cabinet maker, and you're still trying to make it uh, the way you always have by making your, your item from start to finish and of the highest quality, you're going to have to be content to sell it for less because you can't compete with the prices of these factory manufactured goods. So this is going to lead to workers starting to lose a lot of traction. It's also going to, uh, to, to lead to more and more things being interconnected, right? Everything's tied together with the trains and with the telegraph and so forth. It's all part of this ever-increasing, ever-expanding economy uh, that includes all these different things playing their part. So if one thing gets out of whack, everything can get out of whack. So uh, everything is closely connected together. This requires the use of more resources. So cutting down more trees, mining more coal or precious metals. Uh, as I said, the growth of factories and increased population in the Midwest West, but also changing attitudes. So for one thing, nature is no longer considered organic, but rather it has been commodified in a very big way. Now, it's not, it's not that agrarian ideal of Thomas Jefferson of whether you can be self-sufficient and therefore happy and content. It's how much profit can you make? And how can you avoid losing your profit? Uh, this is going to lead to intense competition, the development of what would come to be called the rat race. Now, back in the days of the subsistence economy, one family has a farm, another family has a farm. They're not competing with each other. If anything, they help each other out. Now, that's changed. And there is more and more hope for riches and therefore more and more fear of failure. Everything is much higher stakes now. There is no contentment, no agrarian contentment. People begin to feel like, you know, the rat race, rats in a maze, but they can also begin to feel like cogs in a machine. Now, here's one side effect of this that probably you never would have thought about. Pocket watches. Pocket watches had been around for a, a good long while, but most people didn't own one. Uh, it was kind of uh, the thing, they were kind of expensive and they were more likely to be used by wealthy gentlemen because really they were kind of uh, just kind of a, a marker of your status and your wealth. But now that more people are working in factories, and they have to catch the train to get to the factory on time, to clock in on time, all of a sudden time is important. And all of a sudden, almost all men start carrying pocket watches. And the impact of that can be seen today when you buy a pair of blue jeans. Uh, sometimes you'll notice there's this extra little pocket on the right side. That's where your pocket watch goes, even though no one has worn, not many people have worn one for like a hundred years because during the days of the subsistence economy and everything was small family farms, the whole family worked together on the farm. They, uh, they knew that when the sun came up and you could see outside, it's time to go to work. And they knew that when it got dark and you couldn't see anymore, it's time to come home. And that's really all they needed to know. And they could kind of work with that. 
So those are some of the fundamental changes that take place. Well, I mentioned the Midwest alias the West of that time getting more populated. Now, uh, here is that West, and it's important to realize that at that time, Kentucky and Tennessee were not considered Southern. They were considered Western. Well, as the population grows in the West, then the frontier of the West is going to expand farther westward into the Louisiana Territory, west of the Mississippi River. Now, the process that we are talking about, essentially, uh, the market revolution and the social changes, essentially from roughly, roughly 1820 to the mid-1840s. All right, so... One significant thing that developed over that time was a big, big emphasis on individualism. All right, the idea of the rugged individual or the individual as sovereign. Now, on the one hand, you may, you may say, well, isn't that really classical liberalism, the rights of the individual? And it is, but recall that... Uh, you know, those 18th century uh, revolutionary generation uh, leaned more toward republicanism than liberalism in the sense that they leaned more toward looking at things, although they were protecting the rights of the individual, looking at the greater good, the common good of the uh, community. But now there is this emphasis on being independent, relying on no one, but yourself, to be self-reliant, to have self-determination, to be self-improved, to be self-made, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which is an exaggeration, you know, that's impossible to do. That's originally the, the point of that, uh, that expression. Um, and this is a paradox, because this emphasis on individuality is coming at a time when, with all these rapid changes and everything now being so closely connected by the market economy, everything is more interdependent than it ever was before. And that may seem like a paradox, but in a way, it makes perfect sense because this emphasis on rugged individualism is a reaction against the... Uh, industrial revolution, a reaction against feeling like you're connected to everything like a cog in a machine with no individual autonomy. By golly, you want to demonstrate how much autonomy you have got. And so rags to riches stories became popular during this time. And even with a movement like transcendentalism, which was sort of the New England offshoot of the Romantic movement, espoused by philosophers like Ralph Waldo Emerson and David Thoreau, there was a strong, strong emphasis on the individual, on self-actualization. Uh, and that's a, a weird way that, you know, some uh, New England philosophers could have a lot in common with uh, some of the rough-hewn people uh, heading out onto the frontier. This idea of being self-made. In fact, uh, there was a, uh, a Frenchman who came to America in 1835, Alexis de Tocqueville, um, kind of remin reminiscent of Hector saint jean de Crevecoeur, except uh, Tocqueville didn't move here. He was actually in the United States for France to examine American prisons. Uh, to uh, look for ways to improve French prisons. But he basically, as he traveled around the country visiting prisons, made it into a travelogue, and he wrote a book called Democracy in America, in which he described this strange new creature called the American to his uh, European countrymen. Um, he pointed out that democracy, with a small d, had become a necessary part of American freedom, if you're not aware, 
many of the founding fathers were very suspicious of small d democracy because they viewed it as mob rule. But now there's an emphasis on even non wealthy, non property owning people as being individuals. In fact, it was around this time in the 1820s that most of the states, uh, well, each of the states in turn, removed the requirement that you had to have a certain amount of property to vote. So when the United States was first formed, with all men being created equal, only roughly 6% of people could vote. Only if you were white, male, 21 or over, and owned a certain amount of property. Well, uh, here are some things that de Tocqueville remarked about Americans that I think are still, um, still on, on the nose. He said, for example, what is most important for democracy is not that great fortunes should not exist, but that great fortunes should not remain in the same hands. In that way, there are rich men, but they do not form a class. So he was remarking that Americans don't really seem to mind if somebody gets rich. What they mind is if the same family keeps all the money generation after generation because that's too much like aristocracy, which the United States had broken away from England to escape. Um, he pointed out that whereas most Europeans don't really care that much about money because their class defines them. If you're upper class, if you have a title, it doesn't matter if you have any money or not, really, you are still at the top of the hierarchy. But Americans wanted to make money because in America, money could raise you to that upper hierarchy, which uh, natural uh, aristocracy not existing did not automatically endow you with. In fact, he pointed out that everywhere he went in America, everyone he talked to thought they were going to get rich at some point. They were talking about how they were going to make money and how they were going to make it and how they were going to change their lives, whether it was the bartender or the, uh, the, the stable boy or the chambermaid. He also pointed something out that's uh, important. I want you to remember it a little bit. He said that in America, unlike in Europe, you can't just look at someone and judging by how they're dressed, determine what social class they're in. In Europe, if you belong to a certain class, then you wear that class's clothes. In America, he observed a lot of poor people spending what little money they had on nice clothes so they could look rich. And he noticed a lot of rich people dressing like slobs because they didn't care. That's a, a fundamental difference in Europe at that time. And it also, it also ties in to something else that started to happen, something else that arose kind of parallel with the, uh, the market revolution. And that was the rise of respectability.